I thought we'd, we'd start uh, with something uh, more generic and let uh, all, right. <laughs> all, all four of uh, our, our panelists uh, comment on, uh, but to pull in uh, Don Fisher's insights. Uh, Richard alluded to the, you know, we're in the post comment submission process when the agencies are refining uh, the rules. Uh, and be, be interested in your personal perspectives on what do you think the outcome's gonna be? When might we see final rules? Because everybody in the audience and other organizations are thinking about planning tactics and budgets for uh, 2012 and uh, these things take, take lead time uh, w with that and uh, what might be the areas that, that change as well as what shouldn't uh, an anybody be considering for change. And from Don's perspective, what do you see as the real uh, deal breakers that will prevent organizations that would be capable of succeeding in an ACO environment from participating uh, with Medicare? How much, how much time do we have, Lee? Yeah, uh, <laughs> we, we've got to lunch. You know, uh, there's, there's many, many burdens to the regulatory uh, process that's been issued. In fact, that's probably the biggest problem. They're overburdensome, and the financial incentives are not aligned with the amount of burden that medical groups have to put in in order to be successful. But basically, it's the whole issue of downside risk. Uh, in a three-year period of time, most groups across the United States have not had the experience of downside risk. It takes time to get up for that, so in a three-year period, that's pretty tough. The second is retrospective attribution of patients. If you don't know who your patients are, how can you be aggressively engaged in lowering their costs and improving the quality of their care? The fact that patients can opt out of data submission to the ACO if they go to providers that are not in the ACO. If you think about that, most patients who would opt out are those who are the sickest because they've got all the data. And so they would be the ones opting out. And so, you know, that, that along with the, the, the minimum threshold that's necessary to achieve savings, the shared savings program, the hurdle starts at 3.9% if you've got, you know, 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries. It doesn't get down to 2% until you get over 60,000 Medicare beneficiaries. And if you talk to the folks in the group practice demo, Many of them never got above the 2% threshold that they had for their population of patients, which was quite sizable. I could go on, Lee, but the risk adjusted is another. So what's, what's it look like? You know, it's really, really hard to know when, oh, when the CMS final regs are going to be issued. There are three agencies involved in getting the final reg out, which is different than most regulatory processes. You've got the Department of Justice, you've got the Federal Trade Commission, and you've got CMS. And then it has to go before OMB. And my sense is one of the biggest hurdles we have to get over with this regulatory process is in fact OMB. Because in the law, there was prescribed a savings threshold that would be achieved with the successful implementation of the ACO program. The mean point for that savings is $510 million in the first three years. If they stick to the mean point of 510 million, the regulatory process has to make that bar high enough so that the ACOs achieve that level or else they have failed. So we've actually written to the OMB asking that they take the lower threshold amount, which is 170 million savings over three years, to give CMS and the other agencies the flexibility to lower the minimum savings, to do some adjustments of the risk uh, adjusters and that sort of thing, so we can have some success and, and make this work. So. We're, we're looking at probably regulations coming out very, very late fall or early winter. There's no requirement that they come out before, you know, January 1, but they should. That's when the first CA ACOs are supposed to be implemented. But as we've been advised by CMS, this is a rolling start period. You don't have to start January 1. You can start any time you want to after January 1. So if the regulatory process takes until December, you may take another three months before you apply. Thanks, that's interesting. Richard, any uh, perspective on timing and uh, from your vantage point, what might change? Uh, I actually don't have an informed uh, uh, view on the timing. I mean, I think everybody recognizes that a lot of serious issues have been addressed, and I think it's 
pretty important that every effort be made, or excuse me, the serious issues that have been raised by the comments, I think it's, it's pretty important that every effort be made to address them appropriately. And, and Don's right, I don't think there's a precise, it's not like there's a statutory deadline after which it can't be done. So far, the dates that were previously announced haven't been extended. Um, whether or not they will be remains to be seen. I also think it's, from my perspective, worth pointing out that you know, the most significant issues, I think, are, are really directed to CMS more than the antitrust agencies. I would agree with that. Um, Dana, a couple of questions uh, for you for clarification. Several people wanted to clarify, is the alternative quality contract just focused on your uh, traditional capitated HMO members, and if uh, that's the case, if, when and if will it be extended to other benefit plans, and could you help us understand in the Massachusetts marketplace, what's the proportion of HMO to uh, traditional PPO or fee-for-service benefit plans? Yeah, sure. So um, the AQC right now does only um, apply to our HMO members. Um, so an AQC, a uh, provider organization that um, signs an AQC deal has that um, contract only applying to the HMO side of their Blue Cross of Massachusetts business. Um, and you can imagine that many of them are, particularly now that they recognize that, that they're able to do very well, um, both managing to the budget and improving on the, the quality scores, they're very eager to move this into the um, PPO side of their business. Um, and so the, the and, and uh, to answer the question, about half and half in the commercial, our commercial business in Massachusetts is almost exactly 50-50 split PPO HMO. Um, so we are planning to move uh, this model into PPO. We've been um, deliberate in our holding off on doing that. Um, and that's been for a couple of reasons. One is that we really um, wanted to focus on getting um, more organizations into the contract before expanding the population within the existing contracts that the model applies to. Um, and we wanted to give those organizations a chance to um, make the kinds of changes in, in infrastructure and staffing and all of that. Um, and and gain some traction and some confidence uh, before having them take this on with PPO. We've been you know, really very committed, um, as you probably understand from what I shared about the kind of data that we're sharing to, with groups to support them. We've been very committed to supporting their success and worried a little bit that biting off too much, you know, not just the HMO, but the whole population of Blue Cross members um, could undermine their early success. So, so we've are trying to, to do this in a, in a measured way, and, and we'll move into PPO. Um, then lastly, just to say, um, will we do that with an attribution model based on claims or a physician of choice model, which asks our PPO members to tell us who do they think of as their primary physician? That decision hasn't been made. Um, the latter, you know, I personally and, and many of my colleagues here think is the most elegant way to do this. Um, and we think there's some important benefits in terms of um, just the membership understanding um, the importance of primary care. Um, and we understand very clearly that um, PPO members do have a doctor that they consider their primary physician may not be an internist, and that's okay. But they do have um, such a doctor, and that um, so simply designating who that physician is um, without changing what their benefits are um, is one way to do this. The alternative is through um, an attribution model using claims. We would do that prospectively for sure, um, and our um, claims attribution model, which we've validated both with physicians and with patients, so both sides affirming, yes, that's right, the model got it right, that's my doctor, and yes, the model got it right, that's my patient, um, is able to attribute 85% of our population in PPO, but there's always a, a percentage of the population that's not using care, has no claims in some period of time, and that's one of the challenges. 
um, with using an attribution model as opposed to a, um, a physician of choice model is what do you do with that 10 to 15 percent um, that just can't be attributed because there are no claims that tell them tell us who their doctor might be. Thanks for uh, those insights. Uh, Paul, uh, a number of questions uh, came in and said you talk about accountability uh, in uh, the healthcare delivery system, but no mention of patient responsibility or accountability. And yet I know from our conversation last night, you've done a lot of innovative things with benefits and education at IBM. So could you share uh, some of that and where you think opportunities are from uh, creating accountability for beneficiaries that will help uh, the delivery system be more effective? I think a lot of the data that we're seeing um, is really about accountability coming out of the patient side. One of the practices I visited um, in Florida uh, recently, Javier, a young pediatrician down there, used to have an average of one asthmatic admitted per week in his very busy practice, mostly Medicare. He's now gone into his, I think, 27th month without a single admission. <clears throat> and a lot of that was really empowering the patients um, to, to, be, to be more effective in self-management uh, and, and, and engaging them in a very profoundly different way. I actually watched that happen um, wh where they really have uh, a coach, a team approach that begins to engage the patients more differently. In Pennsylvania, we've seen an 11% increase in medication utilization in our chronic uh, disease patients. And, and a lot of that has been empowerment uh, of the patient to be more effective at, 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 at engaging and managing. We, we did a little survey of our own employees. We did some kiosks in the area where we're doing medical home pilots where we put a, something called a patient partner, a little kiosk where it begins to identify how much the patients understand of what the doctor has told them. What we discovered in our population, who by the way is a pretty sophisticated population, is that 40 to 60 percent of our patients were leaving the doctor's office not understanding what the doctor was asking them to do. <clears throat> so, so I think there's quite a bit of, 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 of uh, change in this concept of patient empowerment and patient engagement. Um, and so in, 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 in IBM, at any rate, we're, we're, we're really sort of putting uh, the lobster in the cold water and we're slowly turning up the heat. We, we, we now uh, reward our patients with, with incentives to address obesity in their family. We discover that actually that addresses obesity in our employees as well. We, we reward them, we reward them if they take their health risk assessment and go down and sit, sit with their patient to go over that. And it's just part of this whole journey um, uh, of lowering risk factors, and it's been reasonably effective. We've invested about 190, uh, excuse me, about 90 million, and we've got 190 return uh, on lowering risk factors. Um, but it's a huge journey, and it's a journey on both sides of communicating more effectively, uh, of really engaging uh, management of patients, and we haven't done that very well in our current delivery system, and we have a lot to learn on both sides. You know, I, IBM's workforce uh, is, is somewhat unique. I think you said that the median salary was around $100,000. It's clearly a bias towards white collar engineer, et cetera. Are the learnings that you're getting and the changes reproducible in the general American population? I think so, because the next place we did that partnership, <clears throat> that patient partner uh, little kiosk, um, was was in uh, Fall, Water Falls, uh, a, community, a rural community in Pennsylvania, uh, with predominantly a Medicare population, and we saw the same the same kind of data, you know, much better, much clearer communication, um, and we're seeing that um, consistently in the medical home environment. Both, and and we see that from the from the community health centers as well, where they where they move to that model of, of much more intensely engaging the patient, much more closely following up. M much more management at the point of care delivery versus, you know, the disease manager calling from the call center in Manila. So. That's encouraging. So, Richard, I guess somebody uh, d didn't uh, hear or doesn't believe that you said there's plenty of clarity. Uh, so the, the question is, what's more important? Is it uh, market share or actual outcomes for the consumer, such as quality, service, and cost? 
and how do you balance that when you look at an individual uh, situation? Well, market share is really is never the end of the story uh, from our perspective. I mean, there, there, you know, there are certain presumptions you can draw from low market shares that cause you not to be concerned because I, as I indicated earlier, that's, that, that pretty much requires arithmetically that there are others that, uh, that are, you know, that can offer choices to whatever the group is that has the share you're looking at. You know, if, if, if we have a situation where, where a, 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 an organization with a large market share um, is not acting in a way that is anti-competitive and is in fact promoting uh, good outcomes and delivering care uh, cost effectively, uh, the fact that they have a large market share is not going to cause them to become a target of an antitrust investigation. Okay. Th thanks for uh, helping to clarify that. Uh, somebody else asked for Paul, you showed the, the pyramid and the upside down pyramid, but should nurse practitioners fit in in the base uh, be below the level of primary care or at the level of primary care? Wh where have, have you seen that? Uh, I mean, I think that I've seen that in many places. I've visited uh, uh, a nurse practitioner-led practice in Philadelphia two months ago, um, and the patients were just ecstatic about the care that they were getting. They were they were very happy. I mean, I think that I think that, that it's really a matter of the scope of practice, which is which is really a decision made by a state um, as to how, and then taking within the scope of practice folks and trying to get them to practice at the top of their license. Um, and and I've seen that. What I, what I, um, what I see in, in large part is, is where the nurse practitioners and the physicians work together as a team, and the, and the, and the playing field is flatter. I'm ha I'm on the faculty at, at Utah. We have care by design there. We're in our tenth year of that, and it turns out that, that the nurse practitioners have a very powerful and important role. And they turn out to be pretty effective managers of our clinics. <laughs> um, and and the, the physicians focus on two things. They focus on difficult diagnostic dilemmas and relationships, and everything else is done by other members of the team. And it's $6 a minute that that primary care doc is worth to us. And we try to keep them focused on those two elements. And I watch what happens in that practice, and the nurse practitioners actually tend to manage the day-to-day -day activity. They manage the huddles in the morning, et cetera, um, and they seem to be comfortable in that role. They don't seem to be as comfortable with particularly the more difficult, dis difficult diagnostic dilemmas because they don't have the same training. But they're probably better at managing the education and training aspect of it than the docs are. I mean, I'm just being frank and honest. Don. If I could, if I could jump in on that, you know, you, you've hit on probably the biggest challenge to moving our model of healthcare into one that's shared savings, and that's the lack of primary care physicians across the country. And I've seen a couple of new models out there, and the one I really like is the one where, you know, if you look at traditional healthcare today, the primary care physician comes in in the morning, and every 15 or 20 minutes of their schedule is filled with patients all day long, and they go home exhausted. And the patients who come in with multiple chronic conditions, which is 48% of the Medicare population, don't get the time or the service they need. And so it becomes very episodic, and the coordination goes right out the window. What I'm seeing in a new model in many of my members is the primary care physician comes in in the morning, and they have no appointments. They have nurse practitioners and physician assistants seeing the patients on a routine basis, and the family physician is there when needed and as needed to fill in. And so when the nurse practitioner or the PA runs across a complex patient, who needs a very high level of expertise brought on by the physician, that primary care doc comes in and spends as much time as is needed. And it really is efficient. And so what you can really do is expand the scope of your primary care practice by using, as Paul says, at the top of the license, PAs and nurse practitioners, and having the primary care doc come in as a consultant and really working on the complex cases. I've seen that in a couple of places. Patients love it because they get the attention they need when it's complex and the providers love it. And it gives the primary care physicians a really work challenge every day because they're now dealing with complex patients, not the ones that they don't need to be at the table taking care of. I mean, it, it frankly breaks my heart when I go around and look at how we practice in primary care today. 
I mean, the primary care doc is spending a third of their time doing what I want them to do. That's difficult diagnostic dilemmas and relationships. And the rest of their time, they're doing all kinds of stuff that could be done as effectively or more effectively by another member of the team. And the, one of the things that's the most frustrating is when they have their butts in my patient's face typing, right? I mean, in, in, in Utah, again, you know, the MA does all the typing. It's all done outside. Uh, I mean, you know, it's not, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to pay a doc $6 a minute to type uh, in an EMR, but and they do. And we're not good typists. <laughs> um, you know, so I mean, I just think, I think that certainly there's, there could be a manpower issue. I, I would agree that we probably need to focus more on, on developing primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, et cetera. But, but I think we really underutilize the ones that we have, and, and we, can, you can, we can utilize them much more effectively. And that model Don described is, is, is a really great model. Well, your comment and your prepared remarks about the need to change medical education and training just resonates because until uh, future primary care physicians experience that as, as they're trained, it's going to be hard to make that, that big transition uh, with it. Uh, another question uh, for Richard, and this is the, the chicken and the egg question that we always get. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you have to have in your clinical and integration plan accomplished before you can contract and within what time period? And is it okay if you stay on a schedule that you lay out uh, in or achieving your interval uh, accomplishments if that's sufficient to contract in the marketplace? Um, I'm not completely sure I understand the question, but let me try to answer it. And, and if I didn't answer it uh, accurately or with a, the right understanding, let me know. But, I think the important takeaway is all of what we're talking about in this setting is prospective. And so you know, the, the, the approval to go forward is based upon our assessment of the plans. Um, and and it's, it is possible, you know, once, once you're approved to go forward uh, to start contracting, of course, um, we don't require um, uh, evidence that the collaboration is, is demonstrating any particular outcome before we approve it because almost by definition it hasn't started yet. Now one of the, one of the things that's interesting of course about, about ACOs is that um, at least with respect to the Medicare um, component, a couple years down the road there's going to be some, apparently there's going to be some uh, you know, evidence upon which to see how they're working. It's not, it's not as clear that we'll have the same ability to do that um, in the commercial market. Uh, uh, but uh, I think the short answer to your question is that it's based upon what the plans are rather than what the performance is. Okay, thanks. <coughs> With that, uh, Dana, a, a couple of questions that uh, are directed at you. Uh, some want to know if your uh, quality outcomes are risk adjusted and also would like to know uh, where, uh, if it's evidence-based or if it was arbitrary, did you come up with the ideal uh, targets for outcomes, the level five, and could you give us an example of, of one or two of those if you have the metrics, because I think uh, some in the audience could relate better to that if, if they appreciate it. Is hemoglobin A1C control at 99% uh, or is it at 62% or what is the number that uh, in Massachusetts you think might be ideal over five years? Sure. Um, okay, so the, um, so the answer is no, that the the quality measures are not risk adjusted. The budgets, I should have said before, are risk adjusted on an um, ongoing basis. So as the populations that an organization is taking care of shift over time, their budgets shift accordingly so that um, there's no uh, incentive to avoid sicker patients. And in fact, there's an eagerness on the part of these organizations to have sicker patients. Um, and, um, but the measures themselves are not risk adjusted. Everyone is, is subject to the same set of, of performance gates. One of the, um, the things that I, I think all of us are aware has been uh, an important and compelling debate in the field has been, should we have actually different uh, standards for practices that serve different populations? So should our gates be lower? for um, practices that serve a disadvantaged population socioeconomically. Um, and many of us, and, and I include myself in that group, have said, you know, we, we should not change the, the standards. Uh, we shouldn't set a lower bar um, or, or have lower expectations of quality for practices that are caring for um, 
lower SES populations. But those practices may need more resources to achieve the same levels of quality that we would expect of a practice taking care of a higher educated, um, wealthier suburban population. Um, well, some of the organizations that achieved those gate five um, levels of performance on outcomes as well as some of the process measures were in fact the, low, the populations um, in the AQC that were caring for the lowest SES groups. So we have in particular two of the eight practices that have a disproportionately large share of lower socioeconomic um, patients. Those two practices made among the largest improvements overall on quality and were um, hitting very, very high bars, in some cases uh, a, a gate five performance which to me was one of the proudest accomplishments of the year one results that, you know, in some ways maybe addressing disparities um, in care better than we could have ever hoped um, by not lowering the bar. Um, then in answer to the question about, well, so what does gate five really mean? Um, I want to be clear that that, that number, it's, it's not a number that, that we picked thinking that sounds good as a, as a high level, you know, goal. It's a number that um, a statistical method called the beta binomial distribution reveals to us what the stable highest level of performance um, in, a, in, a, um, in a data set is. So essentially what a beta binomial distribution is, is it takes the noise out of an observed distribution. So we might in an observed distribution see an organization hit 100. But when, the, when you apply a beta binomial distribution, it'll get rid of the noisiness of, of, you know, chance occurrences like somebody hitting 100 and tell you sort of what's the best that can reliably be achieved at the highest levels. So our gate five score is, the sa is um, set at the 99th percentile of the beta binomial distribution. That's always a lower or less ambitious number, let's say, than what you would get if you set um, the gate five at the 99th percentile of an observed distribution, because that's how the beta distribution works. Um, and then just finally to, to give you some examples in terms of scores. Um, so for A1C control, for example, you asked for that one, um, poor control is what we use, so um, not greater than nine or less than nine. Um, the gate five there is 4.7% of the population. Thanks. Um, yeah. Do you have another one? But I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Um, so for, for um, I'm trying to pick one that, that people will know well. I'll go with mammography screening. Um, so there the gate one score is set at 77%. Gate five is set at ninety percent. Okay, uh, we'll turn to Paul, and uh, you showed some impressive uh, cost savings and reductions in medical expense. Do you attribute all of that to medical home, or are there other uh, factors that were going on simultaneously? I, I think. Um, I mean, w when I look at that data, I think it's it's really about. Uh, communities beginning to look at and moving together. I think of the medical home as really the foundational element of a, of a change in a community that, that needs to occur. And that's how we've addressed it in the communities where we have large concentrations of lives. <clears throat> the medical home sim simply is the system integrator um, where data flows, becomes actionable, and then held accountable um, but it really requires an interaction and a dialogue between the providers, the primary care providers, the medical home providers, the specialists, the hospitals, et cetera. Um, in, interestingly enough, m much of the savings is, is, is re re you know, coming out of reduced ER use and reduced hospital use. And, <clears throat> you know, we, we initially thought there would be some pushback from the hospitals. But in point of fact, uh, I visited a practice in, um, in the rural uh, uh, Iowa, up about 80 miles from, from, from Nebraska, Omaha. And what we saw there was a decrease, and the same in North Dakota, we saw a decrease in ambulatory sensitive conditions hospitalized, but we saw an increase in the number of patients hospitalized for hips and knees. 
And it was a pretty, pretty logical reason. The patients were well enough to get hips and knees for the first time. Um, in that particular practice, there were half a day a week that used to have an orthopedic surgeon that came, uh, and now there's full three, a full three days a week um, which that occurs. Um, and you see a broader catchment area um, in which patients, I saw patients coming from three counties away. I looked at their license plates. I said, why did you come here? Oh, because the doctors are actually following up and following through, right? They're communicating more effectively. And I saw that also in, in North Dakota. So it turns out that, 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 that the hospitals are actually finding out that they're doing a bit better, particularly when they use that for their own employees, right? Um, so, so I think it's probably a multifactorial thing, but the, but the fundamental element of it is really applying some discipline around managing a population you know, within a healing relationship. Well, from a hospital perspective, that's encouraging, and uh, it, it also is a message to uh, some of the specialists in terms of there are upside opportunities as we uh, keep the population the healthier. I love it where this is rolling out because it decreases the amount of weeding that goes on in their waiting rooms. I mean, you know, the, the number of patients that are banging up against them that don't actually have the problem that, that, they're, that they're there for begins to decrease in this, in this model. Um, and, and, and the ones who want to do partialty care, who want to be the consultant and they want to focus on that, and most of them do, you know, that allows them to do that and has their patients much more managed down at this end. Um, I think it's a win-win for just about everybody, really. Richard, uh, could you describe what we should expect if we're going to apply for an ACO and want to go through a voluntary antitrust review? Where would we get the application and what kind of information would need to be submitted? Uh, I'll do the best I can. That's still a, an example of a work in progress, but I mean, the, I think, you know, we have a mechanism in place um, where the two agencies, the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department and the, and the Federal Trade Commission, um, have a joint program where they review mergers outside of the healthcare sector and inside the healthcare sector if they're reportable under a certain uh, uh, or above a certain threshold. So we have we have experience in receiving filings and deciding quickly which agency is going to review them um, and 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 issuing forms that people need to fill out. Now now the reg the proposed uh, policy statement lists or describes at least the types of information um, that, that we think will be important. There may be some changes in that, but I, I think that you know, once we're up and running, there's going to be a mechanism um, that will be as clear as we can about what people should submit and where they should submit it. Um, you know, and that's in our interest as well, frankly, because if we're gonna turn these around in 90 days, we've gotta very quickly decide which agency is going to handle it um, and, and make sure that we've got the information so that we can sink our teeth into the merits. Thanks. With, with that, uh, Dana, uh, you know, we've taken advantage of technology and there, there's good and bad. There's people in the audience who have uh, uh, Googled the Boston Globe and I guess there's a story today with a report from the Attorney General uh, criticizing uh, hospital costs in Massachusetts. So we'll give you a chance to do a rebuttal uh, so everybody gets to hear uh, your, your perspective on it. And uh, to be fair, the, the report talked about all payers uh, and wasn't focused on uh, the alternative quality contract, and it was data from several years ago. But uh, you probably uh, have, have read it and, and can see through s some of the uh, uh, things that, that the Globe highlighted. Yeah, so th thanks for the opportunity to do that. So, you know, it's... Um, I said at the outset of my remarks that this environment that we're in, um, largely because we've accomplished um, getting to universal coverage, but through an individual mandate, has enormous um, emphasis on costs, a lot of questions, and part of that manifests as an annual report by our Attorney General's office, and annual hearings by um, our Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy on spending and you know why is healthcare uh, spending look like it does? Why has it gone up, gone up at the rates it has since last year? And what are we all doing about it? Um, and so the AG's report um, does uh, take a look at spending in Massachusetts, reiterates a theme from last year, which is that 
um, they are enormously concerned about disparities in payment rates and that they remain concerned about the overall level of spending and the overall level of increase. Um, some of the concerns that we have about the report and its um, consideration of the AQC is that um, the, the AG's office did a couple of things that we feel are, are rather short-sighted. One is um, they, they're looking just at 2009 results. Um, so this is, you know, as, as all of us have emphasized over the course of this panel, transforming the way care gets delivered um, is not something you accomplish in one year. And so to judge whether um, global payments or the AQC model is a good way to get to moderating healthcare spending based on year one results is something we feel is just impossible to do. So that's you know one point that I think is really important. A second is that the, um, the AG's office chose to focus on what they call total medical expense, but which really is total um, healthcare payments. So total medical expense, I think we would all think of as expenses on medical care um, and claims. Um, and in fact, the AQC, as I think I, I shared in my remarks, the um, provider organizations actually spent less. They slowed the rate of growth um, in spending, in fact, by 1% relative to the non-AQC segment of our network. But the AG's focus um, was on total dollars given to organizations, including their earnings on quality, including investments that we made uh, through these groups in their ability to have infrastructure, their IT systems, and so forth. All those dollars were included in what they looked at, um, which, you know, that, that view of total spending is an important one, um, but it misses the really critical point uh, about what organizations that came under this new model did to change the way that healthcare resources are being used, that, that we believe because of the kinds of changes in referral patterns and, and attention to transitions in care, really are sowing the seeds of sustainability in our system. And their report just misses that, uh, both because they, they don't have the data to look for it and they really wanted to focus at this very highest level of total dollars that provider organizations received, whether they received them for providing care or as a reward for quality or as an investment in infrastructure, they didn't really care. Um, so we think that's a, a failing of the report, but fortunately it's a failing that will be um, compensated for um, in a very large way by the fact that we have um, a formal evaluation of the AQC um, that's being led by Dr. Michael Chernu, an economist and physician who's at the Harvard Medical School. Um, and they have a very, very robust um, analysis of the year one results of the AQC and are in the process of um, having that reviewed. And, and so hopefully their findings, um, which deal in much more detail with um, the, the types of changes that the AQC organizations accomplished in medical spending um, in year one, as well as the um, quality improvements that they achieved, hopefully that will be out and, and help to shed some further light on all of this. Thanks. We'll uh, look forward to that uh, future report. Uh, Paul, uh, the question is, have you spoken to Richard Gilfillan? I'm sure you have. And has there been any indication of interest in CMMI, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, uh, doing potential pilots on patient-centered medical home or providing a funding mechanism? Yes, I, I speak to Rick quite often, um, in fact. Um, out of Geisinger, and Geisinger was one of the early medical home pilots. Um, they, they currently have three uh, uh, pilots rolling out uh, with CMMI involvement uh, out of CMS. One is the uh, Medicare Advanced Primary Care pilot. The, uh, the second one is the dual eligible, and the third one is the FQAC pilot. So it's pretty robust, their engagement now in, in, uh, in PCMH. Uh, they've been pretty engaged in that. Um, the pilots are in eight states for, for, the, for, for the one that's the multi-stakeholder, the one that I've been most engaged in because that interfaces the commercial market as well. It overlies the commercial market. Those are Maine, Vermont, 
uh, Rhode Island, um, uh, parts of New York, Pennsylvania, all of North Carolina, mm -hmm. Minnesota, uh, Michigan. I think that's eight. I might have missed one, but but that's going to be starting up here in two months. Um, and uh, I mean, so so they are engaged, um, and there are all kinds of opportunities and and uh, grants available. Just announced uh, last week was 52 million for the uh, FQIC medical home opportunity grants, uh, of which they're just that's for 50 new ones that they rolled out. So so there's a lot there's a lot of money on the table. Uh, when I was first in the White House talking about this, um, they said we're going to put more money at this than you can possibly imagine, and I said I can imagine a lot, and they said no, you can't because we cannot let this we cannot let this fail. Um, the Veterans Administration has rolled out uh, $36 million um, for academic medical centers to bang up against uh, medical homes as they begin to build this out for their training opportunities. Six of them have been granted so far. There are going to be more in that arena as well. So uh, there's a ton of money in that space. For, for those who aren't familiar, if, if you go to the CMMI website, they list uh, projects and potential grants and plans, and you probably have to go almost every day uh, to find uh, new, new opportunities and a, and a chance to submit a proposal to access that ton of money. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of money out there. Uh, Richard, we get this question every year, too, so uh, uh, more clarification. Uh, why is the FTC focused on hospital or physician consolidation, but little on payer consolidation? I get that question a lot. In fact, I got that question during the break, <laughs> after, right after I spoke. Um, and, and the answer may not be very satisfying to much of your audience, but it is, it is because of the way uh, uh, responsibility for antitrust enforcement is, devo is divided up between the two federal agencies. Because of certain limitations in our jurisdiction, uh, an antitrust enforcement involving health insurers is handled by the antitrust division of the Justice Department. Um, they have, uh, you know, I, I guess it's probably fair to say just as an observer that, you know, their, their aggressiveness has ebbed and flowed to some degree over the years. Um, uh, there's no question that there's been a lot of consolidation in that sector. Um, they do seem to be paying more attention to it right now, um, and they have in the last several years um, challenged a few regional uh, mergers. They had they, they had one in Michigan that, that they successfully challenged, I think, last year. Uh, and and uh, there have also been some national ones where they've obtained consent decrees with with divestitures. But but the short answer is the FTC doesn't do those. Thanks for clarifying. You know, it, it, as we get near the end of the period, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to take a, a minute or two and share their perspective. I tend to be one who the glass is always half full. Uh, we are in the midst of, of incredible change in healthcare, but uh, we'll start with uh, Don. If, if the glass is half full, why are, why are you optimistic and what types of things do you see in the immediate horizon that are going to help us solve the conundrum of cost and quality in American healthcare? Well, I think the good news is that uh, the Center for Innovation, when they announced just recently the, uh, the what do they call them, the, the premier ACOs, is that what it's? Um, Pioneer. Pioneer, Pioneer ACOs. Uh, they fixed a lot of the problems. I mean, they, they were very, very responsive to the noise that was being heard on the proposed regulations. The minimum savings threshold is 1%, irrespective of how large you are with your enrollees. Uh, patient attribution, or they now call it alignment, can either be prospective or retrospective. It's your choice. I mean, there are a lot of things they fixed. It's still burdensome in many ways, but still fixed it. So it gives us reason to have guarded optimism on that. I also think what gives me optimism is there's a real awareness. When I go up on Capitol Hill or I work with the executive branches of government, everybody gets it that we are in a period of transition and everybody gets it that there's got to be consolidation of providers and we've got to move away from onesies and twosies and small groups into large integrated coordinated care systems where we can actually deliver on the promise of improving quality and lowering costs because physicians talk to each other and they work as teams and they coordinate the care of patients with multiple chronic conditions. And then you carry that out into the marketplace and what you really see is providers are embracing this 
at a time when it's very, very difficult for them to do so. When I talk to my members, the biggest challenge they have right now is how do you get from here to there? Everybody knows we're moving to a new model of payment away from fee-for-service that is based on volume and intensity of services to some kind of a reward for improving the health of a population of patients. But every improvement you make today in reducing costs is top-line revenue from your institution or the institution you're partnering with to deliver this care. And you can't survive over a long period of time by cutting your top-line revenue. And so somehow we've got to figure out how you get from point A to point B without cannibalizing ourselves into a stable and unstable uh, healthcare delivery system. So that's the biggest challenge. But I'm, I'm very optimistic about where we're headed. I think the, the fact that the public and Congress and people in re regulatory business know that we've really got to move towards this new era of coordinated care, team-based, patient-centered, whether you call it medical home, you call it an ACO, high-performing organization, it doesn't matter. We're moving to that, and that's really, really encouraging to me. Richard? I'm also optimistic, uh, and part of that's my nature. But, but uh, you know, if you sort of take a step back, and, and, and or when I take a step back and I think about what the larger goals are of this effort to move forward in the delivery of health care, I mean, it seems to me there, there are three, the three main, main goals. There's, there's improving quality, there's containing costs, and there's improving access. I think that covers most of what we're trying to accomplish, broadly speaking. And I view um, competition, which is the lens through which I see this, the goals of competition as being entirely congruent with those three goals. We're not, we're not trying to get in the way of it. We're trying to be part of the solution, and I hope that we will be. When I look down at Dana's beautiful smile, how can we not be optimistic? I, I mean, you, 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 hear, you hear this story of what they've achieved on the ground in Massachusetts, and it's a, it, it's a work in progress, but, you, you know, and, and I see what, you know, you guys have done um, in Advocate, and, and the goodwill of the folks coming from all over the country to listen to that experience, to, you know. I mean, I just think there's enormous goodwill uh, towards doing the right thing, um, even though our system uh, is so de is designed so poorly and infunctionally in terms of the way it's 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 being paid for, that we're all groping to try to get there. And and I I just sense that, you know, as folks who most of us in this room raised our hand are our healers. In fact, we that's what we've elected to do. I just think there's enormous goodwill to try to want to do the right thing, um, and. And I was also, I mean, that first year they, they rolled out that alternative payment contract. I, I mean, my guess was that, what, 5%, 10% of the folks would raise their hands. I mean, if year one, a quarter of them, unknown, raised their hands and said, I'm willing to be an explorer, right? I, I mean, that gives me immense optimism. Uh, on the ground, when I see at the practice level, people struggling to really, to really do the right thing, as I just did in in Kellogg, Michigan, um, and the excitement of, of doing that. And, and, and it isn't, I mean, they're more motivated about success of delivering better care than they are money, honestly. Yep, absolutely. Dana, Paul set you up for the last comment. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. I, I'm also optimistic, and, and I'm optimistic, you know, because we've seen, as, as as Paul said, um, enormous success in a very short period of time. We've seen that if the incentives are put in place on the provider side um, for, for better care, better outcomes, and reducing the rate of growth in spending, that there's enormous capacity and leadership out there, enormous capacity for creativeness and acting and then succeeding. Um, and so I, I am really optimistic about that. I'm also optimistic about the fact that we see that the result of this actually is producing patient-centered care. It actually is. You, you can't focus on achieving outcomes without engaging the patient in what happens in their life when they walk out of your practice. What does their life look like? And, and what are going to be the barriers to success um, in managing their condition? So I'm enormously optimistic. The things that um, that I worry about still are that um, 
we have a public that really has grown to believe that more care is, is better for them. And we are going to have to start to educate our population about um, appropriateness and what, how much care is good for them, and not just by you know, increasing cost sharing so much that they'd rather avoid care because it costs too much, but really because they think that they understand um, when, when getting surgery is good for them and when physical therapy is better. Um, so there are things that, that still worry me, but overall I think if we continue to play toward people's hopes for the healthcare system um, while being willing to hear their fears and address those, that uh, we really can succeed and, and very quickly. Thank you.